This is my buddy Cooper. Can we lay down? Lay down. You got to do it all the way. Yes. And this is Cooper's roadmap to success. And you don't have to hold it. It should stay there. All right, um, so uh, we just got done shooting the video above, and so I'm going to talk about that one first. So um, I, I talked on the way back, and so I want to kind of share these tips on, on tape. So uh, when you're doing what we just did, now we just went out in the neighborhood and just hoped that we could find another dog, but it's really better if you can to have one of your friends, or and uh, he just moved here, so the guardian doesn't know a ton of people. So I told her to just chat people up who, when she's out walking around and she sees another dog on a walk. And also take note if there's certain types of dogs that he's more reactive to, bigger dogs, shepherds, white dogs, black dogs, brown dogs, loud dogs, whatever it is. You want to kind of look for those dogs because that's what you want to practice. Now, I like to practice this in a big open park. So there's a nice green space with a path that people are walking their dogs by. So that way, it's not a, I uh, mentioned this off camera, training is not a linear experience or dog behavior modification. It doesn't always go constantly up like a bell curve. Sometimes you have a good day, then you have a regress, and you go up, and it's more like a like a stock chart. So basically, what we want to do is we want to set him up for success. So beforehand, I would maybe, before we go to a park, hey, buddy, is I might exercise him. I might play a game of fetch, do some scent games, take him for a walk or whatever it is. Then I take him inside, let him recover and so I'm sitting down, he's sitting down for like 10 minutes, just relaxing. After about 10 minutes and we get in the car and we drive to this park and the park, we pick the time of the day appropriately. If you go from 4:30 to six o'clock, that's happy hour. You're going to see the most dogs there. That's what we want to work up to, but that might be too many dogs for him at first. So first we want, might want to go there mid afternoon, like around three o'clock schools closed. Some people are starting to walk their dogs if they're done with school or whatever, but it's not a ton of dogs. And we have this nice green space at the park so that if another dog starts walking towards us, we can turn and walk away. We have plenty of open space and that open space also helps him feel more relaxed. Now, what I prefer to do is have a friend come over and with their dog, somebody that you meet in the neighborhood. Now, I like to do this where I have my earbuds in. And so I'm talking to the person where they're so far away that I normally would have to yell at them. And I could say, okay, I want you to appear in view. Now, I also look for places that sometimes don't have a, that have obscured views. So let's say that there's, um, I'm here and there's trees here and there's trees or shrubberies here. I can only see this small limited window. Well, if I'm practicing here, buddy, he only see the dog for three or four seconds. If it's open panoramic, then he sees that dog. That might be like uh, 90 seconds of seeing that dog. That might be too much. Now we're doing a little desensitization and counter conditioning. So when he's looking at the dog, I was having you in the video click and then give him a treat. But really what you could do is just treat, treat, treat. That's all right. It just, uh, yeah, you're fine. And while you're, while he's not reacting, if you're just giving him treats, but you want to try to do it. So you're delivering the treat. So if the camera is the person and I'm over here and this is the dog's head and I'm constantly giving the treat here, he's not looking at the stimulus. I want him looking here. So if I'm going to deliver a treat, I'm going to hold the treat in front of his nose. So he's looking in that direction. What we're trying to do is change his emotional response. We want him to be looking in that direction as you're delivering those treats. Now, again, he can't be reactive for this to work. That's okay. That's just for you. Um, and so if he's reactive, then stop and move further away, move behind a shrubbery or whatever. It is. <coughs> yes, I know. I was going to get to that part. Now, when he's not barking and not reacting, we're just going to free feed him treats while he's looking at the other dog. And as soon as the other dog disappears from sight, the treats stop. So when dogs appear, I get treats. When they disappear, they stop. Now the engage disengage is a little bit different than counter conditioning. What we're doing is for engage disengage, if I'm Cooper, I see the dog over there. I look, you click and I turn away to get the treat. And after I do that enough, I'll look and turn away anticipating the click of the treat. Then you're going to click at first. You're clicking now. Eventually you're going to click now when I turn away from the other dog and I look at you. And as I said, off camera, you could kind of deliver that treat a little bit slowly by the time you deliver the treat. If you've picked your location where there's some obscured vision, well then by the time he turns and looks, that other dog is gone. So I look at the dog, I look away, I get a treat and I look back and the dog is gone. I don't have anything to bark at. And by you managing the situation, he doesn't have to bark to make things go away. And that's really the concept for this. If he barks, if he won't take the treat, he whines, he's anxious, his body language gives you cutoff signals. We're, we push too far. Remember, keep this short, two minutes, three minutes of practice. And then we walk away to an area where he can't see other dogs. We spend five minutes relaxing. And if you sit down, that's going to help him relax. If you're standing, standing only seems temporary. And so the idea is to try to maybe uh, set it up maybe two or three times a week where you're doing this exercise for maybe 15, 20 minutes of total practice, but it'll be, you'll be there at the park for 45 minutes or whatever. 
you're exercising them a little bit first. You're picking a friend at first to help you and you're talking to your friend to your earbuds. You pick up time of the park where there's nobody there. And eventually you get to the point where you're just doing it at the park where people are maybe walking in the afternoon. It's, it's a light number of dogs, but eventually a higher number of dogs. And eventually you are going in that 4.30 to 6 o'clock period of time where it's just jam-packed with dogs and he's looking at the other dogs and he might be pulling and whining to get towards them. Now, listen to your instincts. When you get to that point, that becomes a little bit more advanced. Let me know if you get to that point, if you're uncertain. Um, and for dogs, front-facing approach is really hard. So if I'm another dog and I go right up to his face, that's a, the most difficult approach. Dogs usually come to the side and they kind of work around each other, sniffing and licking their other's rear ends. That's what we'd like to see. Um, let me talk a little bit about dog body language. So he's a ridgeback, so you can't look at his hackles. They have hackles all the time, essentially. But a lot of times you can look at the hair on their spine between their shoulders and their, uh, and their hips, and if it goes up or along the spine, that's a sign of arousal. Piloerectus is what it's called. We call it hackles. And so that's a dog's way of saying I'm a little aroused. Does it mean he's reactive? No, it just means he's a little bit more on edge, on, on alert. So um, dog body language, uh, dogs are normally what I call wiggly and jiggly. So if I'm wiggly and jiggly and all of a sudden I get stiff and still, that's a big warning. If I have an open mouth, that's a big warning. If I stare, that's a big warning. My ears come forward, big warning. My tail goes up, that could be a warning. So I look for kind of a combination of those things. Also, is the dog leaning towards the thing, leaning back, or are they standing with their weight underneath them? Um, are they breathing heavy or holding their breath? Those can be uh, indicators of arousal or it being uncomfortable. Um, are the pupils dilated um, or irregular? Does he have hard eyes? Hard eyes are big saucer eyes and unblinking and staring. Sleepy eyes is kind of a good thing. That's what we like to see. If your dog looks like they're squinting, that's a good positive body mechanic. Are their, their face muscles relaxed or very tense? Um, it, you know, if they're baring a teeth and showing a lot of their gums, that's really a cutoff signal. And so if you learn to recognize your dog's body language and you see you're walking down the street and there's another dog and suddenly his tail goes up, he starts getting stiff, he starts moving in slow motion, and he closes his mouth. These are the things that are his way of saying, I'm uncomfortable, and he's moving towards eventually lashing out if those things are not adhered to. Just like if I'm in a dressing room and somebody tries to come in and I'm half naked, I'm gonna say, excuse me, it's occupied. If they keep on trying to come in, I'm gonna raise my level of, of my voice. If they finally open the door, I might shove it closed and shove them away because I don't want them to see me and I'm trying to protect myself, so I'm gonna raise my level. So dogs do the same thing, they just do it in a very quick fashion. So if we can learn to recognize his body language and I see that he's getting stiff because he sees that other dog and I turn around and I walk away the other direction, he doesn't have to go past that point because he got his point across. So learn to watch your dog's body language, not only when, they're, uh, when he's reactive, but also when he's relaxed. What does his tail do when he's relaxed? How, what are his ears doing? How does he hold his head when he's relaxed? When he's happy, what is his tail doing? Is it going mostly to the left? Is it going kind of figure eights? Is it going in circles? So after, dogs are great at reading us, we're horrible at reading them. So I want you to start being mindful when you can know that your dog's in a certain emotional state and then look for the differences between when they're neutral or excited or fearful or anxious. The tail is pretty obvious. If it's tucked between the legs, that's a sign of insecurity. And so if you can learn to, all of, to read all these things and you can get him away from things, he doesn't have to react. So you're now managing the situation for him so he's not practicing getting better at the behavior. And we're also picking a couple times a week, we're spending five, 10, 15 minutes working on creating a positive emotional response. When I look at dogs, I get treats and good things happen and nothing else happens. I don't have to meet them. They don't come close to me. I don't have to sniff them. They don't have to sniff me. He might not want them to sniff him because other dogs sniff him are gonna recognize by sniffing him that he's insecure and uncomfortable. Dogs can detect that when they sniff each other's dogs. That's why some dogs, cover their anus with their tail. That's why probably the expression CYA comes from. So learning to read his body language and, and look out for him is gonna be a really big uh, name of the game and, watch, and follow the steps in the engage, disengage, also really important. Now, if you do walk people, buy people, or skateboards, and you can do the same thing we did for click for looks, or is what I like to call it, engage, disengage for skateboards. So find a skate park. Be as far enough away as where he'll take a treat and sit. And every time he looks at, this, at the skateboards, give him a treat. If he's looking the whole time, just free treats while he's looking at him because he's not barking. It's just like patting his on the back or rubbing his shoulders. You're doing, you're doing so good. You're doing such a good job while you're giving him those treats. That's really what you're saying. Now, if he does ever growl or bare teeth or lunge, I always tell people that they should interpret that as the dog's way of saying, I feel uncomfortable or I disagree. If I tell you I'm uncomfortable and you say, shut up, that's not going to help me feel more comfortable. 
And that's what a lot of us, the guardian here, I don't believe is doing that to her dog. But a lot of people say, shut up because they see that behavior. If you eventually do that enough, you'll teach the dog to stop growling. And instead of growling, they will go straight to a bite. They won't warn anymore. We like the warning because it lets me know you're uncomfortable so I can increase the distance for you and take care of that problem. So never disagree or punish a dog for growling. Okay, so that's uh, kind of covers that video above. I'm gonna kind of go through a quick litany of what we went over today. I'm just gonna go over the highlights because we did it in person. I can't recreate the whole three hours, but I have videos for all this stuff. So if you forget how to do hand targeting, let me know, I can text you a video for it. So we started off by going over marker words. You make sure you're doing the loading exercise. So it's about uh, three times each with a clicker. Click, treat, click, treat, walk around your house doing that. You wanna do that about three times with a clicker, about 12 treats each time, three different occurrences. Maybe today and tomorrow. Same thing with yes, yes, treat. Walk a couple steps, yes, treat. Now, yes and the clicker are the same thing. In the video above, at one point, I think I clicked and said yes. It's like saying L the, you shouldn't do that. So either click or use the, the marker word. The clicker works a little bit better. I would prefer to use the clicker outside because it's a more distinctive sound um, and it does work a little bit better. But yes works great as well too. So um, the, we loaded the marker word and, and so once you've done it about six times, you're done loading it. Then at that point, we're gonna use the marker word. The, it's a marker word is the indicator, a marker is the indicator that tells the dog, that tells the dog it did the thing that you want. It happens the instant the dog does the thing you want. Like for example, for sit, the instant the butt hits the ground. For lay down, as soon as the chest hits the ground. For come, as soon as the dog arrives. Unless the activity has duration, like potty. If he's pooping, then at the end of pooping, I would say yes and give him a treat. If we're saying stay, when I release him, I say yes and give him a treat. So it lets him, it's your way of saying kind of good job, you, well, job well done, and now I'm gonna pay you. Um, we also went over hand targeting, teaching him to touch his nose to your hand, make sure you keep your hand frozen. And so you're putting the treat on that hand and you're saying yes when he touches his nose to your hand. The instant he touches your nose, yes, then put the treat there. Um, and you work on that uh, getting distance. Eventually, if he's over in the kitchen, do it when you're sitting on the couch so he runs over to you. That can be a nice alternative recall for you. Um, now, uh, we also went over cues and when to introduce cues. Don't introduce a cue or use a cue unless you're 90% certain. If I say sit, the dog's gonna sit. If I say sit and the dog doesn't sit, the more you say sit, 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 the less you mean it and you're training your dog not to listen to you. So your dog, if you say sit and the dog doesn't sit, I either anticipate that my environment is too distracting or I have not properly taught the dog to sit. And if that's the case, I go over and lure them into a sit, yes. Lure them into a sit, yes. Do that until it's easy to lure them into a sit. And then I would say sit and then lure and then yes. And so after a while, you're sneaking the word in before the action, but you only do that when you're 90% certain. When I say sit, the dog's gonna sit. Otherwise, we just use our lure and our marker word because we should be 100% accurate for that. I'd like you to make a list of the official cues and then try to be mindful instead of saying come and Cooper and here and over here and here boy, we're just gonna say come. And the first word you say is the most important. So don't say Cooper come or come here buddy or you know, hey, can you come? I'm putting the most important word in the least important position, come. That's it. Um, we also uh, went over, um, I'm, re I'm remembering I forgot to go over something else that I'll go over right now. So um, if he's doing something we don't want, all attention from us is rewarding for a dog. So a dog barks and we say stop or even look at them and go, ah, that's rewarding for the dog. That's a give him a treat. So let's say the Cooper is getting in the trash over there. What I would do is make a positive interrupter sound. Now there are three positive interrupter sounds. He's on sleep uh, behind the camera. Let's see which one he responds to best. Now he looked at that one. Puppy, puppy, puppy. Beep, 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 beep. Now you like the beeps. So let's say that he's over in the trash now. I say, beep, beep, beep. Yes. So I make the sound. If I say his name, that's giving him attention. What I do instead, I make that beep, beep, beep sound. Make sure you say it three times in a row. Don't say twice, three times for animals, three or four times in a row in a high pitched voice. When he looks at you, you chop your arm and say smash. He runs over and touches his nose to your hand. You give him a treat. Then you give him something else to do, a, uh, a collagen stick like I gave him, um, a lick mat, do some training, take it for a walk, play tug of war. Otherwise, he's going to go right back to doing what he was doing. So what we're doing is we're using the positive interrupter to interrupt what he's doing by making an interesting sound. He looks at us. We say touch or smash. He runs over and touches his nose. We've now redirected him. Then we give him something else to do. Most of the time they get into trouble or do things we don't like because they're bored. Yes, that's an example of what's called celebrating. Celebrating is basically waiting for the dog to offer a behavior that's desirable, saying your marker word to let them know that's what you wanted, and then petting them or giving them a treat. So I'm gonna do it right now if he SITs, he's not. That's okay. I didn't ask him to come. Yes, I didn't ask him to come there either. 
see if he's going to do an SIT. Um, but he did something that's desirable. So most of us spend our, our lives correcting dogs for doing things we don't want, and we don't realize that all attention is rewarding. So every time we say, don't do that, you're rewarding your dog for doing that. The better way to do it is when your dog voluntarily sits. You say yes and pet them. They come to you, yes. They give you eye contact, yes. They lay down. Um, anything you want, they pick up a toy, yes, and give them a pet. So if you think about it, do you feel better about your boss? Yes. That rewards you when you do the right thing or that chews you out when you do the wrong thing? Which is more inspiring for you? That's also a way of releasing anxiety. So make sure you pet him every time he does that. So, um, uh, so the more that we celebrate and reward the things that he wants, eventually he just comes and sits in front of you to ask for attention instead of jumping up or nudging you or pawing at you or whatever it is. Now I call that celebrating. The other side of the coin is what I call uh, manners. So if he comes up to me and he nudges me, he's saying, hey man, give me some of your attention. And there's nothing wrong with dogs asking for attention, but that might not be the most polite way of saying it. So, so let's say Cooper's nudging me. Hey, Cooper, he's nudging me. I would say, sit one time. If he doesn't sit, I just go back to what I'm doing. I'm not going to ask multiple times. He's missing out. Now, that was a little bit, this is BS, I wanted that attention. But he didn't do what I wanted. When a dog doesn't do what you want and you don't reward them, that's half of how they learn. So if he doesn't do what I want and I pet him anyways, what does his motivation actually sit? Because he's gonna get his reward. So what happens if he comes over and nudges my hand, he's saying, hey man, give me some attention. So right there, tell him to SIT. Right there, you could have told him to SIT. He was, he was trying to get my bag and his guardian's trying to protect my bag, which is fine, but right there, I would have told him to sit. If he sits, then I give him some attention. He's not getting in the bag, but he is getting something for it. So what I want you to do is next time he demands attention, sit. Yes. And then I can pet him. And if he doesn't sit, like I just did before, I just go on doing my own thing. Eventually he learns that if I do what David wants, there's something in it for me. Most of the time we ask dogs to do things and there's nothing in it for them. How about a sit? See, I said too many, too many words. Sit, fetch. So as soon as he set, I said fetch and threw the object. So this is how I play fetch. Yes. I just held the treat out for him. Now I'm going to ask him, we're going to do it again. Yeah, they're encapsulated in the case. Hey. Sit. Now I'm giving him a little extra time because we're at the end of a three hour session. He's a little tired. So normally I wouldn't ask multiple times, but I want to give you a good example. Come here, sit, sit. Yes, fetch. So when he sits, I say yes. And then I say fetch as I throw it. He goes and grabs it, brings it back to me. I say yes, and then he gets another treat. So that's kind of the equation. So now that may get, this is a great way to exercise your dog, which we'll talk about here in a second. So getting back to manners. So if he nudges me, I'm going to tell him to sit. If he barks at me, I'm going to tell him to sit. If he leans on me, bark, tell him to sit. If he's already sitting here, I'm going to tell him to sit over here. If he does what I want, I say yes and give him attention. If he doesn't do it, I go on to doing what I want to do. This is a great way to teach your dogs manners through the do-over concept. All right. Yes. That's more celebrating. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, we also talked about um, uh, consent. So dog cutoff signals. So if I reach over and pet him, you saw right there his ears went down and he ducked his head. Those are a dog's way of saying, come here, buddy. Uh, saying, no, I don't like what you're doing. Sit, yes. For dogs, front-facing approaches, confrontational, sideways is better. And for us, when we walk up to a dog, that's confrontational. If we stare them in the eyes, that's not always a, a polite thing to do if you don't know the dog. Then we lean over the dog, which is intimidating, and then we pet them on top of their head, which other dogs will put their paw on top of the head to dominate a dog. So it's like four or five things we do that's very rude, and dogs are like, please don't pet me, please don't pet me, please don't pet me. Cutoff signals, ears rotating back, lowering my head, turning my head away, leaning away, refusing to come to you, looking, refusing to look at you, looking at you through a lot of white in the eyes, so we call that whale eye. Um, Licking their lips could be a cutoff signal. Baring their teeth is a pretty obvious cutoff signal. These are all the dog's way of saying, no, I don't like what you're doing. And people are constantly reaching over and petting dogs on top of the head. Then we petted the dog under here and Cooper like put his nose up and he didn't move away, his, his ears didn't go away. 
So cutoff signals are a dog's way of saying, I don't approve or I disagree. And so just because I'm petting Cooper doesn't mean that he wants to be petted, even though I mean it in a good positive way. So every once in a while I'm petting a dog here, I might disengage and hold my hand over here and invite him again. If he comes over, he's saying yes. If he doesn't come over, he's saying I'm good with it. I had enough pets. So the best place to pet a dog is going to be under the chin, on the chest, or on the shoulders. And, uh, and, so, and if you're out and about meeting someone and your gut tells you that he's okay meeting them and they want to pet him, say, yeah, just we ask people to hold their hand out in front of his nose. Don't ever do that if you think he's going to bite them because that's, he will definitely bite them. Sit. Sit. <coughs> This is a temper tantrum. This is, <coughs> this is BS, man. Throw it for me. I don't respond to this sort of thing. I'm just going to keep on taking the camera. I've got, a, I've got a mic here, so hopefully you can hear my, most of what I'm saying. He's throwing a temper tantrum. If I tell him to stop, that rewards him. That makes him more likely to do it again. So now I'm going to ask him to do it again. Cooper, sit. Sit. Yes, fetch. When he did what I wanted, then I did what he wanted. If he didn't do what I wanted, nothing happens. Look at him bringing that back to me because he wants to play the game again. Sit. Sit. Come here. Sit. 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 Yeah, I saw that. Yes, fetch. So... Incorporating a sit when you're doing a fetch is a great way for him to demonstrate a little bit of tipping the cat or respect for you. Yes, in order for you to throw it for me, I have to do something for you. That's good practice and develops what I call a healthy leader follower dynamic. Now the guardian point of fact has, these are rawhide chips and I explained rawhides are bad. You don't want to give rawhides. So I recommend, I gave him a, uh, a collagen stick, which he really liked. I mean, collagen sticks, if you get bully sticks, get the low odor ones are more expensive, but they won't smell. I also like getting my dog cow kneecaps. The analog for the chips that you're getting would be cow ears and you can usually get a bag of those. Um, you can get ox tails, chicken feet, duck heads. They're, most high end pet stores are going to have kind of a buffet of animal parts. Get a bunch of those things. Have them in your cupboard. I like the kneecap because it's good for multiple chews. So when you have a guest come over, if you give him that one of those, he's going to lay down and chew that instead of trying to accost your guest or bark at your guest. You're helping him do something else, and he's practicing a different behavior when he's around his guests. Yes. Again, more celebrating. Okay. So um, get some of those high-value chewing items and stop giving him the raw hides. Um, let me see. We also talked about um, exercise. So playing tug of war is a great way to exercise him. Just make sure you give him a break when he, his energy gets level, gets to level five. Wait for him to settle down to a two or three and then play the game again. Um, you could also play fetch. And like I was saying, sit. When you sit, then I say fetch as I throw it. When he kick, pick, gets it up, don't say anything. Have a, quiet, a treat out waiting. When he brings it to you, say yes and hold the treat out. He drops the object. Put the treat in his mouth, pick it up, and then ask for a sit and repeat that. Sit is another great way to exercise him. You could also get him a doggy backpack, which is a harness that has little bags right here that you can put bags uh, of sand, uh, bottles of water, whatever it is. So now he's carrying something that makes the walk more efficient. Also, something you can think about is people don't think about this is you could play fetch in the house, give him 10 minutes of rest, then take him for a walk. So that way he doesn't have all that crazy energy for walk. He was fine on the walk, but if he did starts pulling or it gets a little bit too crazy. Also use exercise ahead of time. Your friends are coming over in two hours, get him, take him for a 20 minute walk two hours before. Let him sleep a little or re recover, then maybe do some set games, maybe do a couple other things. And so the idea is to get him uh, exercise or mental stimulation throughout the day. I'd like you to uh, see you feeding him out of that supple mat, especially days when you have people come over and you might even feed him in the supple mat when people are here. Lick mats when people are here drain is a nice way to release those, those feel-good endorphins. Same thing as chewing. You get a Kong filled with peanut butter, same sort of deal. Um, also, training is a great way to exercise him. So there's a number of little exercises. Went over the touch, or if you want to go to YouTube, find teach him a rollover or bang your dead or whatever. Practicing that for two or three minutes, three or four times a day can be a nice way to mentally stimulate him and drain some energy. Um, right there, celebrate. Yes. Pet. Yeah. Um, and she's petting under the chin. Now, she did say, good boy. I usually recommend when you say yes, don't say any other words for five seconds. Let that word really resonate so your dog can respond to it. 
So um, mental stimulation could also be looking up. I asked, uh, I showed you a cookie in the corner. I have a video for that one. It's where we throw in the treats. And I have a video to share with you if you have questions about that. But I'd like you to also go to Google or go to uh, YouTube and look for scent games, S-C-E-N-T. Try to find two or four other scent games you can play in the house. These are great ways to uh, get him some stimulation, drain some energy, and you don't have to go outside, especially if it's a busy time of the day when there's gonna be a lot of dogs or for whatever reason you don't wanna go outside. Um, let me see, we also talked about uh, uh, the importance of rules. He already has a number of rules. Um, last thing I guess I'll talk about is the kitchen. So he was going in the kitchen. Well, I guess it was the same thing for the, uh, for the harness. He got excited for the harness. So I told his guardian, practice putting the harness on and then give him a treat afterwards and take it off, go in the next room, put the harness on, give him a treat, take it off. Make it a game where the harness goes on without going for a walk. So we take away the excitement and he gets something. So the leash goes, harness goes on, I get a treat. I like the harness going on because I like what happens afterwards. We also taught him how to stay out of the kitchen. So I went, had his guardian go to, and she was standing on behind the line. He was on the other side line. She took one step back, came back, said, yes, reached for the treat pouch, gave him a treat, and then took two steps back, came back, said, yes, reach for the reach pouch, give him a treat. Then three steps back. Eventually she's touching the microwave. Then she's opening the microwave. She's taking stuff out of the microwave in the fridge. So we're breaking down the activity into small steps, having to practice successfully. And then at the end of each small step, we come back and reward, we say the marker word to say, I'm marking you not coming in the kitchen. Here's your reward for not coming in the kitchen. Now I'm gonna walk four steps in the kitchen. Come back and give your reward. Eventually you go in the kitchen and you're cooking a whole meal and then you get done with the meal, you wash your hands, come out and say yes and give them that one treat. But at first we're gonna do it mindfully. So go in the kitchen. If you're gonna go cook a make a sandwich, before you do that, five minutes before, go in back in the kitchen, walk to the fridge, walk to where, take all the stuff out and just put it on the counter, but don't actually make your sandwich. Then walk away and then go ahead and just kind of hang out for a minute, you know, pet him a little bit, then go back in the kitchen and walk backwards. Now all your stuff is out. You've had him practice, he's warmed up. Then you make, you know, wash your hands, make your sandwich, go back, give him a treat, grab your sandwich, come out here and sat down. You set him up for success. We did some exercise, we ex practiced the exercise first when I didn't need to. Then after you're warmed up, I went and made my sandwich. You're still, he's still carrying the carryover of the benefit. And then you reward him afterwards. So try to be thinking about that. If you're going to do something and he has difficulty with it, how can I help him practice this in small steps and start practicing before you're actually going to do it? Uh, so that way he's not practicing when you're rushed because then you get frustrated. Um, I was trying to think, is there anything else that I covered that you want me to go over? No, I think. It's like I've done this before. How about you come up here, Cooper? Also, I call this imaginary rubber band. So I'm training, if I'm luring him to sit, see, I keep on going back to his nose. I try to keep that treat against his nose the whole time. A lot of people go like this, they stop tracking it. Sit, yes. So you wanna to try to keep that treat an inch or two of his nose when you're luring him. All right, Cooper, let's come back up here and we'll wrap this sucker up. Come here, come on up. Come on, all the way up, come here. Sit. Yes. This handsome fella is Cooper, and this is Cooper's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.